Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name's Justine Shaw and as I said I'm from UQ and I'm talking today around Australia's islands and the lessons we've learned on eradication and looking particularly in the context of restoration and reintroductions. So um, the work that I'm talking specifically about myself is around the islands, but we're also um, with the group of us, we're going to be looking essentially at the recovery of threatened species and how we restore ecosystems. So as I said, I'm focusing on eradications of invasive species, but really, um, and then the, the next group will move on to rest in reintroductions and translocations. And I guess we're kind of trying to give a quick snapshot as quick as we can, talking about what we've learned, some of the decisions making space that these um, are relating to these topics and how we can ultimately achieve optimal conservation. And so, as I said, I've, I've laid the project um, informing island eradications and lessons learned. And this is really about what have we learned from eradications that have been undertaken in Australia so far to date. And so I know I'm preaching to the converted. Um, we have about 9,000 islands in Australia, and that number depends on how you define an island, but essentially there's around you know, 8,500 to 9,000. So every state, not every territory, has islands. And islands have high conservation value, and we know that. Um, and islands hold are a really big repository of threatened species. And the work that we've done through the hub, particularly with um, Nest Project 4.2, we, we've kind of quantified in terms of um, plants and birds and, and, and plants and animals, there's about 280 threatened species on islands at, and really across around 380 islands. So that's 280 animals, not plants. Um, and on those islands, we also have endemic species, invasive species, and some of these islands are inhabited and some of them are, are uninhabited. So really high conservation value for islands. And if we look at why, as um, in terms of threatened species conservation, we would we would focus on islands. The, the departments, um, the government's done that work uh, really well, particularly with the island safe haven program. Um, and in in the in that document, it says because they're achievable, there's built-in biosecurity, there's return on investment and multiple benefits. And I I would even um, when I talk about it in an ecological or in a conservation decision space context, I say that the beauty of islands is that they're finite. So they have really high conservation value, but they've got really distinct boundaries. And that makes them finite management problems and finite um, finite decisions because they're bounded. And it's as those of you working on the mainland know, there's often a lot of multiple pressures, at least with islands, things are bounded and therefore defined. We know the space we're working in and we know the pressures and the threats. So one of the things that we have, um, one of the reasons we have threatened species on islands is because it can be that they're a refugial species, so that that's a last remaining remnant on an island due to threatening processes on the mainland. And so we've got classic examples, um, 40 spotted pardalotes on, on Marar Island in Tasmania because of threatening processes on mainland Tasmania mean the species is now restricted to only a couple of offshore islands in terms of breeding habitat. Um, and similarly, we see that a lot with um, species um, in Western Australia due to, due to cat predation. The other reason species can be, we have such high concentrations of threatened species on islands is because it can be that the species naturally has a restricted distribution um, and it's an island dependent species and there's an invasive species on that island. Um, so your Lord Howe Island, wood in, uh, Lord Howe Island stick insect only occurs on, a, on, on uh, one or two islands and you have a threatening process on one of those islands, which might be cats or rats, therefore the remaining population is, is really restricted. Um, and similarly with grey petrels, that, you know, threatened seabird on Macquarie Island, only really occurring on Macquarie Island in the Australian space and being impacted by cat predation. So it's these reasons that we have um, such the, the interaction of invasive species with threatened species. The beauty of islands, as I said, is that um, they're finite and we've actually seen huge success globally with invasive species eradication. So we know that we can have um, really good success if we put the effort in and eradicate. And we know that from a range of islands. And so one of the things we've really looked at with this project is we've talked to managers and looked at what we, and also into the literature of what we know about eradications in Australia. And so, um, interestingly, we one of the first things we're really interested in from a whole of Australia perspective, well, what have we eradicated and what, what are we eradicating on Australian islands? And so we just looked at Australian islands. And it, interestingly, um, 
this is a count of island um, eradications that have been done. So there have been about 27 islands where we've eradicated cats from Australia over time and a lot more where we've eradicated rodents and even unpacking this um, where our focus has been has been quite interesting and there's lots of reasons for this um, but it's really interesting to see where have we had success and and these are successful eradications not attempted ones and where efforts have been focused and that's a range of reasons driving this but it's really interesting to see where our expertise is and, and essentially where we've got runs on the board with eradicating things on Australian islands. Um, interestingly, um, or perhaps not, um, we have normally we eradicate um, one, we do one eradication per island. And so most islands have, have had one eradication and there's only a couple where we've done multiple eradications and indeed, um, so number four there would would be an island where there've been four eradications. So really we do one and we do it well. And typically it usually only involves um, one species. And so we've looked into where, where that's been done. And so for, for, for context, we've done, they've been in Australia, what's been documented is about 223 eradications have been undertaken on about 169 islands. And again, the number depends on definition of island and whether it's an archipelago or an island. And sometimes in the data, these get grouped, but generally we've done about 220 eradications on islands, which is, which is quite impressive. One of the interesting things um, when we look at how many species we've actually eradicated from islands is um, often we leave a species behind so it's really costly to get rid of all invasive species and something that we're seeing emerge more and more as we're doing more complex islands over time and more islands that have human um, people living on them communities is the issue comes about around um, trophic cascades and so it's um, wonderful to see that we've got lots of um, budding ecologists in the community who's, who, who ask questions about but if you get rid of species x won't that cause an increase in species Y? And so the classic is cats and, and rats will be released from predation pressure. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's happening for Bruni Island in the, in the community conversations, concerned that if you're only going to get rid of the cats, what's going to happen to the rat population? And people are concerned about how they're going to be impacted by rats. These conversations have been happening in the literature as well. And I've just put some examples up there. And this is just Macquarie Island, and it's just a discussion in the literature around the impacts of cat eradication and what the flow-on effects were for the for the ecosystem. And I guess one of the interesting um, points to discuss is, is what we can learn about trophic cascades, because it is going to keep coming up. Um, and it's an issue that, that the public is aware of, not just um, ec ecologists and land managers, but it's it's a conversation that's coming up. And so, you know, it's that, it's that classic um, concepts of things like mesopredator release. And this is a recent paper put out by um, Chris Baker looking at um, three different island systems and how the removal of the invasive predator, and in this case, that would be the cat, the fox or the, the stoat. And then what was the response from the invasive mesopredator? And so so there's, you know, there's modelling, um, there's interaction, qualitative interaction networks and things are being undertaken. But one of the things that we actually found in looking at our work is that we've already got about 20 islands where we took away cats and left rats on the island in, in Australia's eradication history. And so there's really the scope for some for some monitoring to go and see what's happened since 1980 when cats were removed and rats were retained that could actually help just answer some of these questions and really explore them um, with people. One of the other um, great examples of NESP's work in this space is NEST 2.3.3, and I'm, I'm not on this project, but I thought I'd just highlight that this work being led by Sarah Legg and Eve mcdonald Mann and John um, Winowski is involved, and Rosalie Willisty has been really looking at the interaction of what's going to happen with cat control with, with rats and native species. And so actually doing some strategic monitoring um, and some, some collecting information to inform the Christmas Island program so that when cat control or cat eradication is scheduled, we've actually got some data to show what, what the interactions are within the community. And so one take home would be, we can look back on islands where cats have been eradicated and rats have been left, but also there's some, some really nice novel contemporary work being done in that space. So, we looked, we've looked at those eradications, um, we've documented what's there, and we, we can sort of see um, where the efforts have been, what's been undertaken, what species have been targeted. There's really only about 16 vertebrates that have been targeted in these eradications. I haven't looked, I'm not discussing um, weed control in this project. 
Um, and so there's a whole bunch of drivers um, for success in, a, in an island eradication project, and there's been a lot of um, research done in this space. But I think if we look at the Australian context, obviously um, success can be can be looked at by um, you know the species you're targeting, the island size. Um, but some things that have come out in the, in the elicitation or the consultation work we've been doing is having prior monitoring prior to the eradication um, to inform the eradication. So things of understanding species interactions um, and knowing what you might predict. One of the most compelling or strongest opinions that came out from people was having sustained funding through the duration of the program. So not phase one, phase two and phase three, but having the pot of money up front and centre really drove the success of the project. It meant that there was flexibility to deal with things. Another one is having really clear management objectives. And so in this project, we've actually gone back and looked at various um, reports and um, management plans for eradications to see were there clearly defined management objectives at the start. And while this sounds like a real no brainer, often the objective may simply be to get goats off the island. Now that's fine. That's really tangible and very binary. Are they there? Are they, are they gone? But when it comes to informing, has it um, been a success and did you get a return on investment for the $1 million that was spent? It's actually quite hard if the only goal, clear, clear goal, was to get goats off an island. Now, often inherent in the motivation for getting the funding, there's a whole bunch of factors that are, that are um, explained and it might be threatened species recovery, it might be um, removal of cats on an island to get disease out of, it, out of a, you know, an agricultural industry. But it's really important, and I would I would say the government has the capacity in funding to actually ensure that clear objectives are defined at the outset of these projects that are broader than just removal of the invasive species, because it has really important flow on effects and it informs decision making down the track. Obviously, if it's an inhabited island, you really need local community buy-in and there needs to be political will. And that's there's a whole body of research around that. And I think perhaps Lord Howe's a great example of where, of where that, that might be needed. And Kangaroo Island is another example of where that's being done really well at the moment. One of the other factors that came out was the need to be adaptable and to have adaptable management during the eradication. And so we saw it with Macquarie Island when birds started dying from secondary poisoning. The capacity to be able to be adaptable and release Khaleesi virus into the environment was really important. Um, changing the methodology um, of how things are trapped as the, as the target species numbers change. And I guess that raises this point of prior approval for methods. And so um, there's often hurdles with actually implementing the eradication method. And so having prior approval for a range of tools is really critical. And I think if we even look at French Island at the moment where they're looking at eradicating cats on French Island, they're even struggling at the moment to get approval to undertake the most feasible um, method of, of eradication of cats. And if you can't get those approvals and roll out the method that you want, it's really going to implement influence success. So there's a whole range of examples of where we've been successful. As I said, 223 islands. Um, but a really great little case study is Tasman Island. And I think one of the reasons Tasman Island is a great case study is it, it, it's a good example of how, I guess, low hanging fruit. So cats were eradicated from this really small island off the coast of Tasmania. It's uninhabited. Um, it's a nature reserve. And there's one agency, just the state government, um, Department of Prior Industry, Water and Environment were, were driving this and they had their people on the ground. So as part of NEST 710, we actually went out and looked um, at how the, so it had the largest variant prime colony in Australia and also um, lots of short-tailed shearwaters. So we were able to go out and look and count, re-survey re shearwaters. Um, and it's never glamorous taking photos of people doing borrowing seabird surveys. I must remember somehow to be more creative with my photography. But what we're seeing is we're seeing an increase in shear waters, which is really fantastic. It's really hard to determine if fairy prions are increasing because we didn't have very good baseline data. But by having preliminary monitoring prior to eradication of the shear waters and sustained monitoring going on, we're able to show they're ex expanding in the areas they're occupying and, and numbers. And we were also able to um, take the cat detection dog back and it's gone back to the island again and again it's able to verify that there are no cats on the island it's a really easy low-hanging fruit small project 
Um, interestingly, you can see on the face of my PhD student, she's way more excited about being in a helicopter than the, than the dog was. Um, but a really simple island, one species, huge return, um, and a really simple eradication to implement with a great success story. In contrast to something like Macquarie Island, which is another one of the case studies, and I've done a, a leader project on this, and it's um, I'm not going to talk about it in detail today, but for $24.5 million, the Australian government um, was able to eradicate rabbits, rats and mice. It's the largest rad rabbit eradication ever undertaken in the world, and it's also one of the largest multi-species projects ever undertaken. So we're already seeing um, return of bar threatened burrowing birds, vegetation returning, and we've had a whole project looking at quantifying success and, and post-eradication recovery. Another great success is Dirk Hartog. And both Nikki and Dan are going to talk about post-eradication environment and reality on Dirk Hartog. But again, Dirk Hartog, huge island, had really sustained funding like Macquarie Island. They had their money up front. They um, had a capacity to be adaptable. Here's one of the fences. They, they were able to divide the island up in management units, use trapping and cameras and a whole range, a really complex um island to tackle they'd already gotten rid of the goats and the next stage was cats so having those staggered um, eradications over time but keeping the eyes on the prize of, of what the goal was of eradicating invasives from those islands similar to macquarie island cats in 2000 and then the three species follow up 10 years later so these islands are huge they've um, a huge investment i think the actual cat eradication for dirk hartog ended up costing around four million us um, but really great success Moves on, I'm moving on to, to Lord Howe, which is also one of the recent large profile contemporary projects that we've undertaken in Australia, in, in addition to Dirk Hartog and, and Macquarie, and it's been a really interesting high profile World Heritage Island project. So um, Lord Howe, and I, I'm not personally involved in the eradication project, so I'm speaking as an observer here. Um, we went to Lord Howe in 20, 2019 and at, in September when they were really starting the end of that mop up phase with these bait stations and that project was, my understanding, due to be declared a success in September 2021, which was two years post that mop-up phase in September. Unfortunately, as you will have seen, we've got rodents um, on, we've got the rats back on Lord Howe. And so in, ter in terms of success, in theory, it's kind of, it's too early to say because we haven't reached that start-off date. But when we actually look into what's happening on Lord Howe, it seems to be, um, from what the information coming out is, that it's actually a reintroduction, it's, it's an introduction. So it's not an, es uh, an escaped population that's expanded. It's, it's looking like um, new rats got into the, in, into the landscape and um, through freight and cargo. So if you look at the difference between Dirk Hartog and Macquarie Island, they're really bounded, they're really finite, and they've got really tight biosecurity. For Lord Howe, after the investment, I think it was about 15 million Australian dollars, the then the necessary thing to, to maintain that investment is biosecurity. And, and it the, looks like from um, the Lord Howe Island managers that they've identified where the weak point was, um, and it was a cargo ship, I think, and um, the dogs that survey those cargo ships um, had, had detected that there was potentially rats. And so there's a real story to unfold there in how biosecurity can be tightened. And I, I guess I would say looking at how it's been funded and prioritised after the initial investment in eradicating cats. And without that follow-up biosecurity, the security of the initial eradication investment is, is, at, is at risk. So once we've done eradications of islands and we've, we've removed these threatening process of invasive species, one of the really important things to look at is, is, is what's the end point? And I spoke before about having really clearly defined objectives for these initiatives. So if the objective was simply to get rid of cats so that you saw an increase in seabirds, which is Tasman Island, which is really tangible and it's a huge success, that's great. For some of these more bigger islands, which with more species and greater diversity, we really need to think about um, what we're tracking for. And also in the context of restoration, we may have lost things. And so that's Dirk Hartog is a great example of some of the effort being made there to, to tackle this problem. Um, and so one of the things I would think about is how we as managers and decision makers and scientists, what, what we're comfortable with and what we think um, is important things to understand. So with a reintroduction or a translocation, what do we release? What do we put back into the landscape? 
when should we do that? And Nikki and Dan are going to talk about that a lot more. Think about where that pot of money comes from and is it actually tied to the eradication? Is it part of the restoration process or is it an add-on after? And the same would be said for post-eradication monitoring. How is that going to be funded? Because it's going to inform future management. And I think um, it's really interesting to, to look at this concept of, of introductions we've, or, or restoration or reintroductions. Um, to finish off with, I said the success story of Macquarie Island. Macquarie Island has two extinct birds and, and whilst they no longer exist, they have very close relatives or even, um, you know, close cousins or sisters um, on some of the New Zealand, South Antarctic Islands. And we did some work um, looking at, for the red crown parakeet, um, the parakeet, the Macquarie Island extinct parakeet has really close relatives on the neighbouring islands. And we did some work looking at where you might choose a source population. One of the interesting things that's come up is that people have said we can't take a species from the Antipodes, which is a New Zealand managed island, and introduce it to Macquarie Island because it's an introduction and, it, and it's not native. And I think it's a really interesting point to think about in the context of ecology, not necessarily um, po polit political boundaries. And in, in terms of um, disease, people are also concerned about that. So it's a really interesting thing to consider and it's something that we need to probably, um, as ecologists and decision makers, spend more time looking into. And just finishing off with some work that we did on Macquarie Island, we tracked the threatened grey petrels to see where they go in winter. And we're seeing an increase in grey petrels and the rate of increase is greater than the population dynamics of the few relictual birds that were there during cat predation. So we're seeing birds come from somewhere. And one of the great things we found with this tracking data was that where the birds are coming from is where the, the Antipodes birds are feeding in the same location. And so the, the hypothesis is that these birds are Antipodean birds that have now found this empty island that's ready for um, colonisation. We've also done some molecular work with the threatened burrowing seabirds and found that the White-headed petrels are very closely related to the Auckland Island birds, which is um, neighbouring Auckland Island over here. So I think we really need to think about boundaries and reintroduction and source populations and and where what where are our, what are we comfortable with and what aren't we comfortable with and what are we allowed to do. So I'm going to finish there, um, and my fellow presenters will continue with similar themes. Hi, so um, I'm Nikki Mitchell from UWA and together with um, Dan and Kim Otterwell, who's our collaborator at, in the WA um, government in the Parks and Wildlife Service, uh, we've been focusing on, I guess, planning some big restoration or reintroduction projects in WA. And so that's what Dan is going to focus on on the second part of, of this presentation. So I'm just going to give a bit more of a general sort of introduction into reintroductions um, and translocations, I guess. I guess I think most of you in the audience realise this, but Australia and New Zealand are certainly, I guess, some of the biggest players in the world in conservation translocation. So we have a lot of expertise and in terms of our activity in this space, we, we do a lot. So we've done, in terms of numbers, Australia's responsible for more than a quarter of the world's conservation translocations. So in this country, we have, you know, at least all the state um, governments are involved and territories. And of course, it's often it's the core business of a lot of our environmental NGO, NGOs like Australian Wildlife Conservancy, Bush Heritage, Arid Recovery. Um, but so currently we don't have sort of central coordination of, of translocations of our species. We do have a lot of coordination that's probably um, led largely by the West Australian government because West Australia tends to be where most of the remaining um, mammal fauna that are required for a lot of these reintroduction programs are still occurring. But of course, also our AWC also has a lot of populations that they can utilise to um, create a new, introduce um, into their new sanctuary system as that's expanding as well. So one of my roles in the Threatened Species Hub has been as sort of overviewing this theme of translocations, reintroductions and conservation fencing. And Sarah Lee and I have been looking after this. I'm just showing you a whole lost list of names. Don't expect you to read them, except to say that this is a pretty busy space. I think it might be the largest sort of theme in the hub in terms of how many sub projects we've had. And the ones in green are the ones I'm actually more heavily involved with. A lot of my own research work is around how we plan translocations in the light of planning for climate change and where emerging habitat might be or how we might need to assist, it, assist gene flow. But what I'm actually going to try and do now is just build a bit of a thread between two other themes in this um, 4.1, which is the one that Sarah Legg led 
very early in the hub around planning our, our safe haven network. And then I'll link how that, I guess, plan relates to Dan's presentation on genetic management and modeling translocated fauna. So one of the first things that happened in the TSR hub was that a bunch of people met in Melbourne, all the sort of mammal ecologists that we could find were brought into a room and for a couple of days, they were asked to consider all the extant mammal taxa and to come up with their views on how many of these could occur in landscapes that contain predators like cats and foxes and how many couldn't. And the take home message is that there are 67 of our extant mammals that really require areas of where there's either no predators or at least very heavily managed for predator control. So as you can see in this figure, there's lots of species here, don't worry about what they are. The main message is that a lot of them are already sort of secure in havens, particularly on islands. So islands are the black, um, are the, the fenced areas of those mainland um, havens. But then there's a lot of species that are extremely vulnerable. And a very good example is the central rock rat, which is desperately needing havens. I'm not sure if a haven is, is being prepared for that species, but that's one that's basically one of the threatened species strategy target mammals for recovery. And it's really only going to recovery if it can be secured inside a predator managed or predator exclusion area. So part of this haven project was to do some national planning about where our next havens should be. So mostly havens have been, obviously we have natural havens, which are our islands, but we have lots of fenced areas that have emerged. And that's more or less happened in a fairly ad hoc nature so far. But what this work did was to say, well, if we've got investment in new havens, where should they be? And so this basically showed that if these areas that you can see in colour, if we basically put a haven in each of those areas, we would actually be able to capture all those 67 mammal species that need a fenced area secure from predators, because these are generally some of the um, ecological regions and habitats that those species require. The other even better thing was, so currently we have about 190 areas that we would call predator free havens. If that haven network was doubled, that would mean we could do it if we did it in a systematic and strategic way we could have at least three mammal species in with it sorry at least three havens per species which would be a very reassuring outcome so this sort of work was all um, published and talked about quite well in the early part of the threatened species recovery hub but i just think it's a good reminder of, of what's going on with havens the other thing that um, i guess is triggering this real interest in expanding the haven network is the, the real focus on feral cats in the last um, i guess since 2015 with the feral cat task force um, it's there's been a lot of effort put into managing cats and all sorts of um, new tech te technologies to control cats and obviously we're having some successes but i think it's very clear that um, we do need to use havens as a as another method so there was a in 2020 there was a parliamentary inquiry um, into the feral cat problem, the both feral and domestic cats. And actually one of the biggest take home messages from the inquiry when the report came out last year was that they want to basically really invest in Australia's network of predator fenced areas. And they're calling this sort of new, new vision project NOAA. And as a result, there's been new funding. I noticed Ollie Tester just mentioned that it was something like 10 million for the, from the environmental, environmental restoration fund has now been allocated to um, expand Australia's haven network. I'm not quite sure what's happened there, Lisa, maybe you might be able to tell us a bit more about that um, in the Q&A at the end. So we're gonna have a situation where we're hopefully we are gonna have an expanding haven network. And some of these areas though, of course, are gonna to have to be pretty small areas. Fencing is expensive. It's challenging in some topogra topographically in some places. So they're gonna to have to be managed as small populations. And so a really, um, perfectly timed paper has just come out. This is a review that was led by researchers at Monash University. Um, they reviewed more than 600 studies where they were focusing on the management of small populations. And it's really rare in science to see, or in a scientific journal to see such a long title, um, but the title does tell you the message. It says, few studies use genetic data to examine the risks of inbreeding depression and outbreeding depression is what they're alluding to. But if you don't consider genetic risks, in managing small populations, then generally what happens is that those populations are managed in isolation. So this is an illustration from that particular um, paper that came out. This is 200 studies where they actually looked at what the management recommendations were and whether or not genetics had been considered in planning for those species. 
the main take home message is that um, basically what we're looking at here is under a risk assessment, we had some uh, researchers and managers were considering inbreeding depression as a risk, others were considering outbreeding depression, but not both, or they didn't consider either of those risks. And if that's what happened, the slight differences in considering different taxonomic groups, but invariably what happened was the recommendations were to manage those populations separately. But when genetic risks were considered, both inbreeding and outbreeding depression were considered by managers, and you can see this is only a small proportion of studies, only 16%. Mixing was the recommendation. So it's really clear that we recognise there are genetic prob there are problems with managing populations that are isolated. Um, but generally, when those um, when the detailed thinking about the risks of those populations face from not not mixing, um, the, mostly people are recommending that mixing should be occurring. So this is an interesting point because when Dan tells you a bit about the Dibbler case study that he worked on, there's a really interesting question that's rising about whether the Dibbler population should be mixed. And this is something, this is really something that's um, it's fairly new in the, in the mammal translocation space. So I'm just going to now sort of lead into what Dan's going to talk about. So in Western Australia, there's been two pretty significant projects happening in the last sort of 10 years or so. The first of these is the one that Justine's just introduced on Dirk Island. Island. So you know, this has been a project that's been planned for at least 30 years, um, but there's a reintroduction phase which is well underway now, which began in 2017. And then, of course, the Australian Wildlife Conservancy in parallel has Mount Gibson Sanctuary was also established recently, and they've also been progressing with lots of successful um, translocations into this fenced area on the mainland over the last few years as well. If you put that into context, just looking at the Dirk Hartog Island, this is a map just showing you of the area of havens on um, that we have available in Australia through time. Um, this is predator free areas. You can see this just by adding Dirk Hartog Island in 2018. That has more than doubled the estate we have now that is predator free for, extra for Australia's threatened mammal fauna. So this is a really significant opportunity to populate um, new mammals, restore mammals back into these landscapes. That's a really big island that's going to be incredibly important in the conserving mammals into the future. So this is just interest this is just really to show you the species that were planned for reintroduction in both these projects. So Dirk Hartog is also known as return to six return to sixteen sixteen, which was the time that Europeans first landed on the island. So at that time, there were at least 12 mammal fauna and a, and a bird um, that have now have been extinct and are now being restored. Similarly, over at Mount Gibson, AWC was its list of species it was wanting to reintroduce to Mount Gibson was very much informed by what would have been in that landscape in the past. The main point is that these species are already on our endangered and, and vulnerable lists. And you can see the ones that have the same colour. Um, and or got the underline, those species are both being um, introduced around the same time in these different projects. So that's a pretty challenging thing to do if you're the organisation that's responsible for authorising those translocations, thinking about when the populations are harvested to provide the source populations for these projects at the same time. So Dan is going to, oh sorry, no, Dan's coming up. This is just showing you, I guess, um, it's a slide from our collaborator at DBCA, Kim Ottawal, just showing you, I guess, some of the planning that DBCA has been doing. They began with some trials in 2017 with some of the hair wallabies, and then they began introductions. So they actually planned the years that they were going to be harvesting from nearby islands and releasing onto Dirk Hartog. Um, and they knew already that one of the species wasn't going to be a direct wild to wild translocation. The Diblo is in such small numbers that they were re realising that captive breeding stage was going to be required. So this is basically laying out what they've been doing and it's roughly um, where they're up to now. So Dan's part of the presentation, which I'll flick to next, is going to focus on four species. And you can see three of them are those underlined ones. That means that these were species that both um, DBCA needed for the Dirk, Hartog, Dirk Hartog project and the Australian Wildlife Conservancy were sourcing as well for their restoration at Mount Gibson. So these species have quite different ecologies, life histories, different information and quality of information about their genetics. And, and so Dan's, I guess, going to focus on how that information was pulled together in population models to help us plan the design of, um, of harvesting to provide new, new sources for um, translocation. So I'll just hand over to you, Dan. I think you're going to, I'm going to stop sharing and um, you're going to take over.
Okay, well, thanks, thanks very much, Nikki, and um, hello to everyone. Um, so I'll just um, carry on um, where Nikki left off then. Um, so, yeah, really, what I wanted to discuss today was just a little bit about what what risks might be involved with translocations. Um, and this is um, a quote from actually it's actually from one of our papers um, uh, where we say that conservation translocations take many forms. Um, reintroductions, reinforcements, genetic rescue, assisted colonization, and in all cases should be carefully planned as they are costly and, and their success is hard to predict. Um, and so here you can sort of see the a process uh, of, of translocation underway. But um, in the case of Dark Heart Tog Island, for example, um, if, if ferals were still present, such as uh, feral cats and goats, um, then there's obviously going to be less chance of success. Um, and so there many um, factors that could reduce the chance of su success and um, this is another example from the Shark Bay region, the banded hair wallaby um, and if you can um, just to have a quick look at this graph you can kind of see that there is a quite a strong fluctuation in population size um, for the banded hair wallaby in Shark Bay. Um, so the, the red line is kind of showing you here what the population size is doing over over the a period of time of about six or seven years. And it, it, it can really fluctuate around about 75%. There can be 75% reduction in total numbers. And that sort of um, cycle seems to lag um, the, the rainfall um, during that period. So obviously, if you're going to translocate, um, you would be trying to translocate at a, at a peak rather than a trough. So it's an important consideration. And another thing um, associated with translocations is that you're effectively creating a, a small population and everyone will know um, in this audience uh, uh, the, the risks involved with small populations and extinction and but there's also a, a genetic perspective to that as well and so if you were <clears throat> to, to create a small population then you can get into this sort of vortex um, where you're allowing um, random genetic drift to occur at a stronger rate. So you might lose genetic diversity by creating a small population and you may also lead to some inbreeding within your population. And both of these things could then lead to a loss of genetic variability. Um, and then because of that loss of genetic variability, there may be a reduction in individual fitness and population adaptability. And because of that, then you might have um, lower overall fitness, lower reproduction and higher mortality. And because of these two things, then it might lead then to an even smaller population. So there is this contributing factor by small um, population and the um, genetics that can be involved with that. And I've talked a little bit about uh, genetic bottlenecks there, perhaps. Um, and this is just a quick slide to show you what we, we mean by genetic bottleneck. And that's something that we try to avoid. Um, and what you have on the left is just a, um, a parental population, if you like. And this one happens to live in a bottle. Um, it's got um, maybe equal numbers of the, the blue and the, the yellow. Um, but when you go through a bottleneck, you're just subsampling a few numbers from that, from that parental population. And as a result, you end up with um, an, a population that will possibly, quite possibly, have um, genetic divergence from your parental population as well as lower diversity. You can also have compounding factors such as founder effects where there may be an increase in frequency of detrimental um, genes just by chance. So you try to um, avoid genetic bottlenecks in these, um, in these processes. So something that would allow us to look at all of these factors combined is, is the population viability analysis modeling. And really what we're doing with, with the PDAs are, are trying to take life history parameters of a species um, and combine it with some stochastic variation um, from the environment as well as maybe some um, variation that's more periodic within the environment um, and you combine these factors um, together to get some e um, estimate of survival probabilities and population growth um, and that's really why PVAs are quite so powerful and you can you can um, adjust them to this to your species um, in question and you can even with some um, approaches bring it down to an individual level where you can just pick certain individuals from populations and, and, and move those into your new population. So you can work at various levels. Um, and so it's quite a powerful tool to manage translocations. Okay, so getting straight into the, 
um, species at hand. Um, first one I'll talk about will be the banded hair wallaby. And I, um, the banded hair wall, wall, wallaby is a project I worked um, with Kim Ottowell from DBCA and Mike Smith from AWC. And this is just showing you what their historical distribution used to be, which seems to be a common story for many of these um, threatened species in Western Australia, where there's a distribution that runs across the South Coast into South Australia and some um, beyond. But then um, after the arrival of Europeans, these distributions have been restricted to just several islands off the West Coast. And in the banded hair wallabies case, um, that is Bernier Island and Doray Island are the remaining two wild populations of banded hair wallabies. Um, <clears throat> now, Foray Island is mentioned here as well. This is um, an, an, uh, an island that is managed by Australian Wildlife Conservancy. And um, at the time of this project, uh, there was concurrent harvests being planned for the banded hair wallaby to move from the the wild populations, as well as for Foray Island in the case of um, AWC, and being moved to both Mount Gibson, which is inland here, as well as to Dirk Hartog Island. Okay, so um, this slide is just kind of showing you a little bit about what the um, translocation history was of banded hair wallaby. And, and if you see on the left, it's um, we have the parental populations, um, and the two smaller triangular populations or the captive bred populations, um, which neither of which now no longer um, exist. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got the translocated populations, um, the historically um, translocated populations of Foray and Waterin. So um, as you can kind of see, it's it's a little bit complicated. There's been different numbers being moved from different islands. Um, and what we were really interested to see with this was what is the impact of, the, of this translocation history on the genetics um, of, of um, the remaining banded hair wallaby populations. For example, um, if you only move 12 um, into one site, it, will that give rise to a genetic bottleneck? OK. So some questions that were coming through uh, were, what has been the impact on, on the genetics diversity of from this translocation history? Um, how best can we maximize genetic, genetic diversity of new populations going forward? And how will the source populations cope with these concurrent harvests. All right. So um, this is a, a little summary of what the genetics told us. What we have here is just um, this is called a structure plot. But what I'm really trying to show with this is that the, the different colors represent different genetic clusters. And so here you can quite clearly see that, that um, amongst those populations, we really just have two genetic clusters um, within banded hair, banded hair wallabies. Um, looking at the to historical translocated populations of Foray and Waterin, which are, are both um, established populations, we can see that Waterin seems to have gone through a population bottleneck. So it was only 12 individuals, if you remember, 12 founders, and that seemed to have given rise to a population bottleneck. Um, Foray, on the other hand, hadn't gone through a population bottleneck, but it does seem to have lower genetic diversity. Now, we had quite small sample size for 4A, um, which could be a contributing factor and needs to be confirmed. But um, there is a, a, the evidence that we had suggested diversity was a bit lower in 4A. OK, um, so water and shows genetic bottlenecking and 4A potentially has low diversity. So these are these are sort of important things to understand so that we can um, move when we're making new translocations, we can learn from, from those sort of, sorts of things. Now, what did the PVA um, return? Well, we um, were able to sort of show with the PVA that the source populations should be able to cope with the concurrent harvests to both Mount Gibson and Dirk Hartog Island. It seems like they're, they will be resilient to those concurrent harvests. Um, we are suggesting that a, about 120 hair wallabies are needed for um, high survival of about a chance of survival of about 90 percent or higher we're also recommending mixing um, from the two source populations and um, this will this will help maximize genetic diversity um, due to the similar habitats between these two islands we don't feel there's any risk of outbreeding and um, depression here um, that does seem like founder size is quite important for the survival of um, banded hair wallabies um, and if you go 
um, start to go much lower than 100 or, or 80, then you start to see this decrease in survival probabilities. And something else we're actually able to look at with this project was also the impact of, of, of these cyclical drops in rainfall might be on new populations. And so if you see these two graphs on the right, what we're really just showing here is when we increase the frequency of drought, you can see that the impacts on the probability of survival of populations and also on population size is, is quite dramatic. So that might just let us uh, or help us decide if, if we know that there is um, a, a drought period um, approaching or if we've just come through a drought period, that perhaps those conditions will actually impact how well a new population is going to um, establish. OK, and if you're interested in um, um, that project and reading more about it, that we have got it published into uh, a hub report. OK, so moving on to the next species, um, the dibbler. Um, there's some dibblers on the left. This work was done with Zara, um, at Zara Asia, um, who was an honours student with us. And we worked um, and got a lot of help from, from Tony, Tony Friend from DBCA. Now, here's um, uh, the common story. This is a historical distribution of the dibbler. Um, and as you can see, it stretches down across uh, the south of uh, Western Australia. Um, and this um, uh, figure shows what the current distribution is. And now it's just been restricted to um, this one site on the uh, one remnant site on the south coast around Fitzgerald River National Park. And there's also a translocated population in the Penyant Nature Reserve. These are what we refer to as the mainland dibblers. Um, but we were interested in the Durian Bay Island dibblers. And the genetics that we've done on the, on the dibblers showed that, again, we've got these two um, genetic clusters, uh, which are defined very well by Boulanger Island which is one parental population, and Whitlock Island, which is another parental population. Escape Island is actually a translocated um, population, which has established, and its founders came from both of those parental populations. So we did find mixing in the genetics, which is what you would expect. Um, we also were able to reveal that there does seem to be bottlenecking occurring in the Boulanger Island, and Whitlock Island has a dramatically lower genetic diversity. OK. Now, at the time of this project, um, the current census estimates for these um, three islands on Boulanger, Whitlock and Escape were quite shocking. So at the time of the project, the estimates that we had, the best estimates that we had, were that there were 10 adults on Boulanger um, Island, 33 on Whitlock and 20 in Escape. So with those um, sorts of numbers, it's um, action stations and the translocation management plan was put in, uh, has been put into place that involves captive breeding to try and increase numbers um, at Perth Zoo. Um, so um, I just wanted to note here that the, these islands are, are not drawn to scale. Um, these three are the Durian Bay Islands and on the right you've got Dirk Hartog Island and the three Durian Bay Islands could effectively fit into one of these little bays on Dirk Hartog Island. So that's a, an idea of how big Dirk Hartog Island actually is. Um, and this figure in the middle is actually um, a, a dibbler at Perth Zoo with um, eight pouch young um, in the pouch. And that's um, the maximum number of young a dibbler can have. So it's actually quite important when you're doing your PBA models as well. OK, so the questions that we had for this project were how many um, dibblers are needed to start a new population on Dirk Hartog Island and what is an optimal harvesting scenario? So we ran some PVAs um, on, on this um, and on this slide I just wanted to show you um, three different things that the PVA can tell us or can be used for. And this initial figure is showing um, what projections into the next 100 years look like for the for the current island dibblers. Um, so using our PVA models, we were showing that over 100 years, survival probability is um, reducing dramatically over. We're showing that um, 
genetic diversity is also reducing dramatically for all three um, all three populations, although Whitlock started off particularly low and couldn't get too much lower. Um, interestingly, for the for the for the iterations or the, the populations that would survive into the next 100 years, the population size actually remains quite constant. So they're not reducing in size as time goes by. It's just that they have a lot less chance of, of, of survival going forward. So that look looks pretty bleak for the island dibblers if left unmanaged. Um, we also wanted to um, look at what factors might be driving or having an impact on survival probabilities. And so um, I, I did some sensitivity analyses and ran a regression analyses on, on, the, on that data. Um, I used founder size, carrying capacity or, or K, as well as the frequency of, of droughts. Interestingly, founder size doesn't seem to have much impact on survival probability of, of new populations of, of dibblers. Um, but carrying capacity and drought probability does. So in other words, when moving new populations, it may be quite important to um, ensure carrying capacity um, is, is above around 200, we, we, were, we were suggesting, um, as well as trying to avoid droughts as best as possible. OK, um, so the final um, showcase of what the PVAs could do for us here. We're actually in this particular table, we're trying to show what various harvesting strategies um, were, were doing and how, how they were looking. And what we were, um, what I'm showing here is if you take a different number of individuals from each of the parental populations of Boulanger and Whitlock, and you combine them in a, in a captive breeding population, what, um, what is the resultant gene diversity in that captive breed, breeding population, as well as what is the impact on survival of the source populations. So we're looking at so impact on the source populations as well as the new captive breeding population at the same time and trying to be optimize these quite sensitive trade-offs. And what we ended up um, choosing was our scenario eight, which is really using 14 adults from Boulanger and six from Whitlock. And that seemed to um, give relatively good survivor probabilities in the source populations, as well as maximize gene diversity. So you're able to compare these various scenarios within your PVA models and then try and make an informed decision as how best to harvest. OK, so based on our work, we were able to make some recommendations. Um, we were suggesting 14 from Boulanger or six from Whitlock. Um, we we're suggesting at least 80 founders for a new population would be would be ultimate um, and we would also um, be suggesting and recommending the carrying capacity be greater than 200 in a new location and that these populations are pretty sensitive to drive frequency. Um, Dirk Hartog Island of course um, is well going to have a carrying capacity or have a, um, the, the maximum number of individuals that can can live on Dirk Hartog Island is obviously going to be great, far greater than 200 so that's that's great. OK, and we're just currently finalising um, the report on, on that, and that will be out very soon if anybody would like to get more information on that one. OK, so in this um, slide, I just wanted to um, uh, summarise two further species, but I won't be talking about them in too much detail. But I just wanted to showcase again um, why PVA might be a, a powerful, useful tool when, when planning translocations. And the two species I'm going to chat about here are the shark bay bandicoot, um, which I work with Karen Hargon from the University of Sydney. There she is in the top left. And the shark bay mice. And this is with a current master's student, Rebecca Kwa. And um, what I just really wanted to show here was that um, both of these species have factors, different factors that are impacting their survival. So we can incorporate those different factors within our PVAs to then make spe species specific um, projections. For example, in the Shark Bay Bandicoot, uh, it, it, because as the name suggests, it, it resides in the Shark Bay, 
um, it is prone to these population boom and busts that we see as a result of the cyclical um, these cyclical rainfalls. Um, it there's also had um, uh, there's also a consideration where one of the populations of shark bay bandicoots in the shark bay area had had passed through a captive um, breeding program, Harrison Palm. Um, so there's this case of these multiple translocations and what would be the impact of that on um, genetic bottlenecking, for example. Um, and there's also this um, issue with concurrent harvesting where these source populations are required for um, two different translocations. Right, taking that across to the shark bay mice. Um, now, I'm sure you're all aware um, that recently there have been some cyclones making their way down the west coast of Australia. and this. Um, uh, species is, is quite prone to the cyclone effects, especially more in the more northern regions around the Montebello Islands, where cycl cyclones can effectively um, wipe out a, a vast um, amount of, of their habitat. Um, so that's something uh, that's very important to include in the, in the models. Um, at least one of these populations of, of shark bay mice are quite homogeneous. Uh, um, and showing quite low genetic diversity. Um, there's also been a history of some failed translocations with the shark bay mice. Um, and as I said, um, uh, other species also has had, had a captive breeding program. So these things could all impact, for example, um, their survival probability as well as their genetic diversity. And so incorporating them into a PVA model um, would then allow us to make these projections. Um, okay, with the ultimate aim of maximizing genetic diversity going forward. Ah, and there's a little cyclone. Okay. Um, and the Shark Bay Bandicoot work, um, Carolyn and I have um, written this report, and that's available if you'd like to uh, read more about that. And what we're really trying to do is, is get these results and these recommendations in place. Um, prior to translocations occurring. And in this case, we were able to help inform um, the managers that concurrent harvesting would be okay for this species. Um, and for the banded hair wallaby, we were able to um, show that translocating over one year um, was just as or, or even a little more effective than over two years. And so making these sorts of recommendations as well can really help the logistics of, of of, of the translocations and, and keep costs down amongst other things. Okay, so in conclusion, um, the genetics um, can tell us how many distinct uh, populations and lineages may exist within some of these um, uh, endangered species and across the remnant populations of these um, species. It'll show us the diversity that has been retained and it'll show you how that uh, diversity has been is distributed um, between those populations. So, for example, it may be really important to make sure you include some individuals from a population that has no, um, that does not share its genetic variation with some of uh, the other populations. Um, PVA um, can give us these species-specific population trajectories and survival estimates. Um, we can um, develop optimal translocation scenarios for new and source populations and, and for the, some of these West, Western Australian species, the source populations are, are at risk. And so including them and minimizing any impact on those source, pop, source populations is, is pretty key. Um, and we can also in, include environmental stochasticity in the modeling. And this is ultimately to provide some evidence-based conservation management and long-term survival of self-sustaining populations. Um, and as I said, if we can get these recommendations prior to translocations, that's ideal. But even if we can't um, and translocations are already underway, these models will still um, be able to be used as, as points of reference um, for future translocations or, or supplementations of the translocated populations. OK, so that's the talk. I just, um, uh, Nick and myself, were very keen to acknowledge um, all the people that have helped us along the way. Um, and I'll, I'll now pass over to the next person, Adrian. Um, so thanks. Um, today I'm just going to talk, give you an overview of um, the reintroduction planning that we've done at Mulligan's Flat 
uh, Woodland Sanctuary. Um, and I mean, more, the more recent planning has been supported by the Threatened Species uh, Recovery Hub. So I'll, I'll, in the talk, I'll explain how that's helped us feed um, our planning into the strategy for the sanctuary as well. As I mentioned earlier, we've got Daniel Iglesias, Stuart Jeffress, Jason Cummings and Rosie Cooney and uh, from our partners at ACT Government and Jason from the Trust. And But there's a, there's a bigger um, group of people who are involved in, in these projects um, to get us where we are now. So really Mulligan's Flat, some of you may have been to Mulligan's Flat, but um, it's a sanctuary in the north of the ACT. And this started as a, um, a collaboration around research with the ACT government on restoration, but really developed, snowballed into something much bigger than that, involving the community and involving science uh, communication. We like to think of the project as really, we're aiming to be a catalyst for change in terms of conservation and using the place as an outdoor laboratory, but also informing thinking about restoration in Australia. Um, and where we see ourselves, as I said, an outdoor laboratory, where so, we, we sort of, um, we, we sit between, uh, you know, the more captive end of, of the spectrum and also wilderness. So we sit in the middle and really are, we see our role as, um, as doing a lot of uh, the work around the species and the ecosystem we're working on and then hopefully informing what happens beyond the fence outside, outside the sanctuary more broadly. So we're in uh, critically endangered box gum grassy woodland. And one of our things in that, in that influencing change is around reversing the shifting baseline. So we've lost a lot of species um, uh, from our ecosystems like elsewhere in Australia. And we're uh, not only about reversing the baseline in terms of the actual physical species, but also our expectations as a community, a society for what we want to, want to, want to restore environmental quality. So when we've uh, thought about our selection of species, we're thinking about a food web and we're thinking in this image here, you can see the light gray species. We're thinking about putting species back into that trophic web and rebuilding the system. So that's, that's kind of un underpinning thinking when we've been thinking about uh, which species to return. And when uh, we're talking about our species selection, you, we can't really disentangle it from the development of the place, Mulligan's Flat, it started as a uh, as a collaboration, particularly with the ACT government, with other researchers. But as it's grown, it's also its uh, governance has changed, and the people and organisations who've been involved in more in more recent years, the development of the trust, which helps co-manage the uh, sanctuary and also communicate with the community. So back in 2009. Um, we uh, had a group, a species management panel that informed our management group, and that had a range of, range of representatives, expert representatives from CSIRO, the ACT government, ourselves at ANU, MPWS in New South Wales, and uh, the DPI in New South Wales Invasive Animals. Um, and we had a process led by Fred Ford, who's now at Defence, around you, um, developing selection criteria for the species that we wanted to put into Mulligan's Flat. I should say we the first fence was built in 2009. So this was this pushed us to think about well what do we want to put into Mulligan's Flat and how should we sequence that. So we had three key documents that we developed in that group, um, and from that process uh, we had a set of uh, criteria that we worked with back in uh, back then, and. This using these criteria, we went through and, and identified a set of species, a, a long list of species that potentially could come into Mulligan's flat. And then we and then we went through those systematically to come up with a priority list. Oh, thanks, Renee. You still hear me? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so once we uh, had that process, there was a um, Fred Ford um, was looked at records um, and also uh, cave deposits, um, looked at the different species in their niches, body size, habitat, to sort of narrow us down to a short list. And I should say when we're doing reintroductions at Mulligan's Flat, we um, 
we always uh, do these in an experimental framework and um, uh, Will Batson who uh, was originally a, a PhD student with us but went on to be the sanctuary manager um, at Mulligan's flat and is now a manager in uh, NPWS in New South Wales came up with this this process of looking at systematically looking at the tactics we use to increase uh, uh, success of reintroductions and this is the framework in which we now reintroduce species to Mulligan's flat and the first priority list of species uh, we had four species it was the eastern betong the new holland mouse the bushstone curlew and the southern brown bandicoot and the eastern betong uh, the new holland mouse and the uh, bushstone curlew are ones that we have reintroduced we paused the uh, southern brown bandicoot because we didn't want two ecosystem engineers at once when we were first doing this so we we paused that though it's still on the list subsequent to that from that original list we also uh, um, um, had a, a research program to bring back the eastern quoll and also we're working on the eastern chestnut mouse as well from that original list and uh, in this example here this is the this is the tactical framework we um, applied to the um, the eastern quoll and we've looked at the very where you see those ticks those are the various areas where we've used tactics in which to improve the success of the reintroduction of the of the quoll at mulligan's flat as um, we were uh, as the mulligan's flat was developing um, the role of the community uh, and, and uh, became uh, um, increasingly important as, as the organization grew and there was increasing success of reintroductions, increasing profile. And that's the point at which um, the, the threatened species uh, uh, hub came about and that we saw that as an opportunity to um, support a process to review what we were doing with uh, selection process. And we um, Will Batson um, uh, led a, a um, uh, uh, consultation process with a range of stakeholders to start to look at that list that we had. It was still built on the original selection process, but also looking at some other things like community interest uh, and um, funding opportunities and that sort of thing. And ultimately, um, what that's led to is a is a document which is a I, I guess what we're calling us for now a sub strategy uh, describing our uh, enhanced process in this second species selection and also preparing uh, translocation proposals, draft translocation proposals for our next list of species. So th those are all prepared um, and ready to go. Um, in our criteria for the second process, um, we had a set of uh, initial eligibility criteria. So that's building on Fred Ford's work the, um, the top four of those. And then we added some additional ones, including ones about complementarity with strategic management, potential for community engagement and education uh, uh, is something that we want to take into account, remembering that part of our mandate or part of our aims are also around engaging the public and also whether or not uh, reintroductions might be research based and research funded and also uh, as with other reintroductions around the country probability of success cost benefit and so forth and our next our next set of species or lists uh, that were identified out of that are the australian busted um, brush tail fasca uh, rosenberg's monitor koala and um, spot tail quoll and i should say when we're doing this in that tactical framework a lot of our reintroductions start with just pilot projects, working out um, what works and what doesn't work. So we will uh, we we take an approach where we'll we'll start with a pilot and then we build up from that build based on the information um, and and the new tactics that we devise. Um, now the the list that we've developed with the um, with the uh, um, threatened species hub now has fed into our, uh, our new strategy for Mulligan's Flat. And this strategy is a really important document for us and a bit of a milestone for our partnership. As you can see, the, the aim is for this to guide us all the way to 2045. And, I, and I, don't expect this, I don't expect this to be exactly as it is now. It will obviously evolve, but we're, we're really thinking about our reintroductions and our selection of species in that sort of long-term context. 
So this this document's been developed with the partners, uh, with traditional owners, the Nunawal, um, to really set out where we are going in the future. And it, we've had uh, public consultation for this, and we've uh, had overwhelming support for the uh, for the strategy overall. But importantly, um, as part of that strategy, th that set of species uh, in this more stylized version of our food web, th that set of species are now incorporated in this strategy and have the endorsement of the community. And this will be our, now our guiding document. And the next stage from this point is working out the implementation and the actual logistical uh, prioritization. But um, I guess the point I want to make is that through this gradual evolving process, we've been we've been feeding what we've what we've taken from our selection process into our longer term strategy uh, for Mulligan's Flat. Um, so that's a very quick overview of the approach that we've taken. Um, and uh, we'll be saying more about it in the future, but it's a really good time to be able to um, to just share with you that that I guess that journey of Mulligan's Flat and how how we've been thinking about things.